It's the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Stand up, stand up. You've been sitting way too long. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. My name is Steve Scrovan. I like my co-host, David Feldman. Hello, David. Good morning. And the man of the hour, Ralph Nader. Hello, Ralph. Hello, everybody. Today's show reminds me of Joseph Conrad's statement. The horror of it all. Stay tuned. On today's program, we're going to continue our coverage of the ongoing crisis in Gaza. First up, we're going to speak to Janine Jackson, who is the program director of FAIR, which stands for Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting. She is also the host of FAIR's weekly syndicated radio show, Counterspin. In general, FAIR does exceptional work analyzing how the American corporate press covers important issues and the biases in that coverage. And not surprisingly, the genocide in Gaza is no exception. In a recent analysis of leading newspapers, including the New York Times and the Washington Post, Fair determined that, quote, their pages leaned heavily toward a conversation dominated by Israeli interests and concerns, unquote. We'll speak to Janine Jackson about why our papers of record so skew so heavily toward a pro-Zionist perspective. In the second half of the program, we're going to reacquaint ourselves with the human side of this tragedy. Dr. Tarek Haddad is a member of the Virginia Coalition for Human Rights who grew up in Gaza. He has lost nearly 100 family members in the Israeli bombardment. In fact, on October 25th, 10 members of his family, all three generations of one side of his family were killed. Last week, Secretary of State Antony Blinken held a roundtable meeting to discuss the situation in Gaza with a number of Palestinian Americans. Dr. Haddad was one of several invitees who refused to attend. We'll speak to Dr. Haddad about why he made that choice. As always, somewhere along the line, we'll check in with our steadfast corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber. But first, we heard the news today. Oh boy. David? Janine Jackson is the program director of FAIR, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting. And she's the producer and host of FAIR syndicated weekly radio show, Counterspin. Ms. Jackson contributes frequently to FAIR's newsletter, Extra. Her articles have appeared in various publications, including In These Times and the United Auto Workers' Solidarity, and in books, including Civil Rights Since 1787 and Stop the Next War Now, Effective Responses to Violence and Terrorism. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Janine Jackson. It's a pleasure to be here. Welcome indeed, Janine. Tell us about FAIR and what it does. It stands for Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting. Well, FAIR, thank you, is a media watch group. We've been around since 1986. And the basic mission is consumer advocacy. You know, I really do see media criticism as consumer advocacy. We basically try to call folks' attention every day in every way to the conflict between journalism, which is a public service and a a public good, and media, which in this country at this time is a profit-making business. And those things come into conflict in lots of ways, and they affect the news that we are able to see and hear. And so what FAIR does is to try to talk about and write about and call attention to the fact of that conflict, the reasons that journalists are not always using journalistic judgment to determine what gets in the paper. And it's not about changing the New York Times or improving ABC News. I mean, that'd be great. It's really about educating us. You know, it's really about talking to people and giving people questions that they should bring to bear when they're looking at any news media, whether it's the New York Times or whether it's the online thing that your uncle sent you that's in all caps, we always need to be bringing critical questions to bear. And that's really what FAIR tries to do, is to remind folks of that all the time. Now, tell us about the most recent report in the light of the Israeli genocide in Gaza. Well, we did a research Piece, and I want to call out Julie Holler, my colleague, but also Xenia Gonickberg, Philip Hosang, and Pai Leo, who are our interns. FAIR does not function without interns. 
But we took a look at op-ed in the New York Times and the Washington Post from October 7th on the Hamas attack through December 6th. And this is, we're looking at opinion columns, right? We're not looking in this particular case at news reporting. And it was very interesting. It always is. But the first thing that I would say that we found, we always ask who gets to speak in the newspaper, because obviously the people we're hearing from are determining the, the content of what we're being told. And it's sure. interesting that the occupational category, whenever it turns to who gets to speak, it's government officials. It's military and government officials, and this was the case in this study as well. And I, I want to highlight the fact that we're looking at opinion columns. So we know that military and government officials are being sourced a lot in the news reporting, but even in the opinion columns where there's room to get in other perspectives, we still see the New York Times and the Washington Post relying for at least a quarter of their guest essays on government officials. Well, what does that mean? It means you're not going to hear from people who are employed by the U.S. government. You're not going to hear highly critical discussion of what the U.S. government is doing. So I think that's an important thing. We look at what's the job that these people that are getting to speak do. And then also journalists, other journalists are the second highest occupational category that are bylining these op-eds. So what I like to say is we hear a lot from people we hear a lot from. The conversation becomes kind of insular, and it's very much a pro-U.S., whatever the U.S. is doing, position, with some criticism around the edges. But the point is you're not hearing from the people who are recipients slash victims of U.S. policy. You're hearing overwhelmingly from the people who make that policy. And that was one of the things that we found in this op-ed study that I think is sort of baseline significant. Well, give us um, some names of columnists in the Post and Times. You now you've got me scrambling, but one of the things that we also found in this study was that a lot of New York Times editorialists and Post editorialists like Nicholas Kristof, like Thomas Friedman, were also bylining op-eds like Brett Stevens, those folks we were also hearing about. We heard from the former U.S. ambassador to Israel, Daniel Kurtzer. We heard from Gershon Baskin, who has negotiated previous deals. We've heard from folks who have had various positions in the U.S. government and in U.S. military operations, they were getting bylines. We were hearing from them. And again, it's not that we don't need to hear from them. It's just who else do we need to hear from? We need to hear other voices in that conversation, particularly in opinion columns, where you've got room to include folks who are not on staff. Well, it's actually more intriguing than that. Brett Stevens is the bullhorn of Netanyahu on the New York Times editorial page. He gets a lot of space, and anybody who wants to criticize him from inside the Times knows they're going to be accused of anti-Semitism. He's the one who defines what anti-Semitism is. He actually wrote a column a couple of months ago called Anti-Semitism, a Primer for the Perplexed. He's right. assumed the role of defining it. And so cheapening the currency of real anti-Semitism, like occurred in World War II in Europe, that he's intimidated people inside the Times from looking at his columns critically, which are full of advocacy, advocacy of policies that are unconstitutional or violating the Geneva Conventions or federal law, or simple factual mistakes as he rolls out one column after another out of the Netanyahu cabinet. So yeah. how do you react yeah. to this? I mean, it's really much worse, Janine. It's terrible. And I would send folks to FAIR.org for the full report. But, you know, if you, you only need to look at his headline. Hamas bears the blame for every death in this war, was a Brett Stevens column. The ceasefire now imposture, where he's maligning anyone who was calling for a ceasefire, was calling for an end to bloody violence. That's an imposture. And then also the attacks, and this is another big thing that the U.S. news media are doing, is vilifying anyone who calls for peace or a ceasefire or a diplomatic way forward as anti-Semitic, as you're saying, but also as unserious, also as not grown up. So the anti-Israel left needs to take a hard look at itself, Brett Stevens wrote. And also the left 
is dooming any hope for a Palestinian state. And all of this conveys beyond the information, so-called, that's in it. It's conveying an attitude. It's conveying a posture which says, you're wrong. If you look at images of Gazans dying, of the UN is now saying maybe 100,000 Palestinians killed, wounded, or missing under the rubble, right? And he's saying, yes, but if you say we need to put a stop to that, you are probably anti-Semitic and you need to grow up, essentially. And I find this so horrifying on so many levels, but it makes me angriest because it's lying to people about themselves. It's lying to us about the way we feel and what we believe and what we are capable of. It's even worse because these columnists don't even read the reporters in their own newspapers who've done right. often great features, satellite imagery of neighborhood by neighborhood, obliterated by Israeli American-made F-16s over Gaza, on the scene, the descriptions, videos showing the screaming and the grieving, amputations without anesthesia because hospitals are being closed down because they couldn't get the essential supplies, medicines. It's not that the news part of the newspaper is failing to do its job. It's people like Brett Stevens who said in one column recently, he didn't think the level of force used by the Israeli military was excessive. He then said, Every death in Gaza is due to Hamas, you know, blowing apart refugee camps and schools and mosques and roads and hospitals and clinics and ambulances. That's all Hamas is fault. Right. So we have this hesitancy, even by Nicholas Kristof. He's always making some good points, but every other paragraph he's backing and filling and backing and filling as if he's being intimidated by this defamatory slur of anti-Semitism. So there's no critique other than fair that actually takes it apart. When was the last time you saw the American Friends Committee on legislation, the Quakers, get an op-ed in the New York Times? When is the last time you saw the editor of Middle East Report, which has been coming out for 45 years, started by two retired U.S. ambassadors to countries in the Middle East, get an op-ed? So it's not only a slant, it's an exclusion. Of voices. Now, they've had Professor Khalidi, they've had some Palestinian Americans as op-eds in terms of their own personal experience. But in terms of policy, there aren't many like Professor Khalidi who are allowed entry into the hallowed two pages of the New York Times. What do you think of all this? Well, you know, done? when you mentioned Kristoff, and I think folks think of him as a humanitarian and it's interesting because he wrote pieces talking about civilian casualties. He wrote pieces sort of lamenting the devastation. But then, as you say, you know, the next paragraph, he will refer to a ceasefire as a arguably, he used the word arguably, a Hamas victory. So we're talking about a ceasefire, the ending of the mass murder and violence and displacement and ethnic cleansing of Gaza. He says, well, you know, I understand why people might want to call for that, but that would be arguably a Hamas victory. And that tells you the limits of debate. And I don't want to end without saying that at FAIR, we call for all kinds of things all the time, a range of voices, an absence of censorship, a balance of perspectives, stop the over-reliance on military officials. But we do assume and hope for a bedrock of humanity. And I think that a lot of listeners will have front of mind the piece by New York Times columnist Thomas Friedman, in which he compared the targets of U.S. bombs to vermin. He compared the nation of Iran to a recently discovered species of parasitoid wasp, all right, that injects its eggs into live caterpillars. And the baby wasp larvae slowly eat the caterpillar from the inside out, bursting out once they have eaten their fill. This is an entire column by Thomas Friedman in the country's so-called paper of record in which he compares Lebanon, Yemen, Syria, and Iraq to caterpillars in which they have venomous eggs hatching inside of them. And they therefore calls, you know, you're talking about bugs, you're calling people vermin. So then he says, quote, we have no counter 
strategy that safely and efficiently kills the wasp without setting fire to the whole jungle, close quote. This is very, very old school demonization, dehumanization. I can't believe I'm shocked every day, and I'm still shocked by this New York Times column comparing people who are currently dying under U.S.-funded and built bombs to vermin. Especially since the prime minister, which Tom Friedman despises, Netanyahu's cabinet ministers after October 7th, said that no food, no medicine, no electricity, no water. These are human animals. And they were described yeah. in those terms. And for Tom Friedman, who is the supposed star of foreign policy columnist in the New York Times, to pick that up shows how tone deaf he is. It's uh, there's, there's also one-sided words. Not only do they only apply, like CBS refers to Hamas terrorists, but they never refer to the massive targeted civilian deaths by Israeli state terrorism. The other thing you never hear, Janine, is do Palestinians have a right to defend themselves? They're the occupied. They're the oppressed. They're the invaded. They're the ones whose houses are being bulldozed at night by Israeli military in the West Bank, of course, now Gaza. And Congress, you never hear anybody in Congress except two or three people say Palestinians have a right to defend themselves. It's always Israelis have a right to defend themselves, as if other people don't have a right to defend themselves. And the columnists pick that up. They constantly say Israel has a right to defend itself. The question is, what's itself? What's its borders? That's the big question. Every country has a right to defend itself. The question is, does Palestine have a right to defend itself? Yeah, it goes to another main absence, including of news reporting, which I agree there are excellent, exceptional, in-depth articles that talk to real people and present issues in a way that is understandable. But in general, even in reporting, there's a lack of history. So I have had people in my life say, what's a Palestinian? Palestine doesn't exist. That's not a country. Well, part of that ignorance comes from a media that don't start the clock except at last week or a month ago or five years ago. They don't give you the historical and the social and the international complexity and context to understand what's happening. And you're talking about language, which is, of course, something that we look at. And in this study, even of op-eds, again, where papers have the space to include a range of views, nobody is using one or two people use the word apartheid to describe the situation in Israel-Palestine. This is a term that, it has a definition, and international groups and human rights groups have a definition for that term, and they've designated this as an apartheid situation. But when media don't talk about it in those terms, even in their op-eds, well, then it makes more sense to have people say, I don't even know what even is a Palestinian. What even does that mean? There were clear calls, even during this study period, which again ended at December 6th, there were already clear calls for a ceasefire. But we only found two mentions of the word ceasefire in opinion columns at the New York Times and one at the Washington Post. So media are not just dehumanizing, but they're also not reflecting the way that people, including in the U.S., even think about these things. They are in inadequate reflection of what public opinion really is. So they're really just trying to lead folks in a particular direction rather than reporting on the way folks actually feel. And the situation in reporting and opinion on Iran eclipses history. We toppled the popular democratically elected leader Mossadegh in the 1950s of Iran and put in, again, reinstated the Shah the brutal Shah dictatorship for 29 years. You don't think the Iranians remember that? So right. when George W. Bush described Iran as part of the axis of evil with Iraq and North Korea, and then invaded Iraq, are we surprised that the Iranians are freaking out? We had the U.S. military on the east in Afghanistan. We had them on the western border of Iran. You have Israel sending lethal operations into Iran surreptitiously. We have all kinds of sanctions on Iran, all kinds of talk in jingoistic circles in the U.S., bomb Iran, bomb Iran. 
get rid of the regime in Iran. And then we wonder why Iran is freaked out and wants yeah. to have allies in Lebanon and, and, and Syria. I mean, the total obliviousness. We don't ever ask the question, what if the shoe was on the other foot and exactly. we were surrounded by some massively powerful Islamic military power and behaved like that? You think we'd be sitting around twiddling our thumbs? This is yeah. the indication of empire. This is one of the markers of empire thinking. Janine, Absolutely. have you covered letters to the editor? How about that one? How fair well, are letters to the editor on this subject? Well, you know, we've not done a research on it, but it's a thing that I always, or recently, but it's the thing that I always say to folks, because I believe that it's still true, that the letters to the editor are some of the most read pages of the newspaper. So folks think, oh, it's spitting in the wind. It's not. If you write a letter and you get that in the paper, that is actually incredibly meaningful because that's what a lot of folks read in the newspaper. And the other thing to say is that although we do know that they are curated, we know that they're not printing all of the critical, certainly not the letters that are critical of the media outlet itself. But we also know that newspapers in particular we have no letters to the editor space in other media, right? It's even disappeared in television and radio. There's no talkback space anymore. But we do know that newspapers might need to get 50 letters presenting a point of view to print one of those letters. So another thing that I always encourage people to do is write that letter anyway, because even if your letter doesn't get in, your letter might be helping another letter that represents your perspective to get into the paper. So I'm glad you brought that up because no, they don't reflect the range of opinion that exists in the country. But part of that has to do with folks' disengagement with media. A lot of folks have just given up on mainstream news media as being an accurate reflection of the world, of what they need to know, of what public opinion is. They're not there anymore, so they're not even bothering to interact with it. But I think it's worth doing, and folks should remember that that's what a lot of folks read, is those public letters to the editor. It's worth doing for another reason in the Internet age. If they don't print your letter, you can put it up on websites. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, and going to what you were saying, one of the things that is weirdest, frankly, about U.S. news media is the way they pretend that there is no international community, as though they don't understand that folks are able. I'm able to read the British press. I'm able to read press from sub-Saharan Africa. I'm able to see... Iranian news media. So when U.S. news media say, oh, the international community is with us, well, I can push one finger and see that that's not true. So it becomes even more strange, the idea that, oh, of course the, the U.S. is with the international community. The whole world is behind the U.S. and whatever the U.S. is choosing to do. We know that that's not true. What we don't have in mainstream news media is an explanation, an explication of those other worldviews. They are not incorporated into the news that we are generally consuming. So we have to kind of patch it together for ourselves. Because if you just read the New York Times and the Washington Post, the U.S. is the world. We're the only good country in the world. Anything we do is democracy. Anybody we bomb, we're bombing in service to democracy. And you're just supposed to keep swallowing that. And I, I feel that elite news media don't understand that people are not buying it. We're not buying it anymore. And so these efforts that we're now seeing to label anyone who calls for a ceasefire, anyone who calls for peace, an anti-Semite, anti-Israeli, a horrible person, and let's release a list of their names and make sure they never get jobs and never get into school. This is bizarro world censorship. And I don't know how media can continue to exist and continue putting forward this view that tries to shut everyone up who isn't saying the official prescribed view, because people aren't accepting that anymore. We understand that the U.S. is one country in a world of many countries, and we do not have a right to go around the world killing whoever we say we want to kill and saying that we're doing that in the name of democracy and human rights. The sale is not working anymore. I wanted to ask you, the problem is a little bit more 
nuance here. When I read the Times and Post, I managed to clip a lot of good articles on this whole Gaza, Palestine, Israeli war, and I don't find them having any impact whatsoever on Congress. One of the reasons we started our new newspaper, the Capitol Hill Citizen, is to show what can be reported on Congress that is not official source journalism. Your group, FAIR, which puts out a nice newsletter, too, called Extra, we'll tell you how to get it in a moment. You ever focus on the coverage of Congress in the context of different subject matters? Well, you know, that's interesting because one of the things that is very frustrating to us is the way that news media cover democratic participation and electoral politics. And so what we find when we do look at coverage of Congress is the stories are not about congressional representatives responding to constituents. The stories are overwhelmingly Republican Congress members fighting with Democratic Congress members. So it it makes it seem like a sporting event, you know, like a football game. Who's going to win today, Democrats or Republicans? And what we don't see is the gap that exists between sometimes what both parties are doing and what the U.S. public is calling for or wants. I know folks know about Citizens United and the idea that we think money is speech and that basically just pull a lever every four years and that's supposed to be the extent of your democratic participation and your role in making policy. But media play into that too by suggesting that the policies, the decisions that affect every moment of all of our lives are mainly a fight between these two groups that we're meant to believe are very, very, very different from each other all the time on everything, and who's winning, who's up, who's down this week. And so it was the cash register, too, who's raised more money in the last month than the other. Mm-hmm. That takes up a lot of space as Absolutely. Well. And, then, yeah, and you're, who you're are they right. raising it from? You know, who are they raising? <laughs> yeah. Not you and me, you know. You know? Right. <laughs> they're, they're raising it from corporations and wildly wealthy individuals. And is that who we want in charge of our politics? I'm all for media talking about funding and financing, but talk about it in a critical way. Talk about why people with money have more influence than people without when we know that people without greatly outnumber the others. Can you tell the listeners how they can get the newsletter and how they can access more affairs reports? Well, I would very much thank you, first of all, and I would encourage folks to go to our website, fair.org, F-A-I-R.org, and you can learn about the newsletter and subscribe to the newsletter extra. You can also find out how to get access to Counterspin, the radio show that I do every week, and I love that it is not only a podcast, but it's also on brick-and-mortar radio stations around the country. And then part of what we do on the website is to encourage folks to take action. So when we see something like the Thomas Friedman column, we put in a little information. Here's how you can write to the Times. Here, here's how you can speak to the New York Times. So it's also kind of an action network. But fair.org is going to be the place for folks to learn about all that we're doing. And thank you very much for the opportunity to say that. Thank you. We're talking with Janine Jackson of FAIR. Steve? Janine, what would be your vision of an ideal media landscape that would be fair? Well, thank you, first of all, for calling it a landscape, because sometimes when I give speeches and I say all the things that I say, folks will come up to me afterwards and say, all right, well, now I don't like the New York Times anymore. What can I read? And they're looking for a single replacement media outlet that is going to give them a fair and balanced vision and tell them all they need to know. That doesn't exist. So we really are talking about a landscape of different kinds of media. And what I want to say is that landscape needs to involve media that are differently structured. So can there be for-profit media? Sure. Should there be state-supported media? Absolutely. Can there be media out of academic institutions? Absolutely. Can there be things that are utterly listener-supported? Absolutely. I think we need all of those. And in that context, we need to always bring our critical thinking skills to who is funding this? What is their relationship to power? What am I not going to hear from this outlet because of its structure and because of its relationship to power? And it doesn't mean discounting all the news they give you. It just means being conscious. So I see a landscape of differently structured, differently funded media outlets 
but that have a vision. What is missing is funded, supported outlets that have a bottom-up vision, that don't define news as what powerful people say and do, which is what we're looking at right now. So there need to be outlets that are talking to community at a community local level. There need to be outlets that are profiling whistleblowers and folks who have critical things to say about institutions within which they work. There need to be outlets that are bringing us international perspectives that make it clear that the U.S. is not a shining city on a hill, necessarily, and that tell us what's happening in other places. The very fact that you use the word landscape, it gets me to that answer. I think we need a range of media outlets that we have access to that bring us a range of perspectives that are not simply top down. Well, we're seeing some of that with the Intercept Press Organization, Center for Public Integrity. Absolutely. Uh, the lever, we're seeing a number of folks, and a number of folks are just supporting themselves on Medium or on Substack. There really isn't a replacement. Can't expect something to be served at your breakfast table that's going to give you a view of the world. There is no substitute for informing yourself independently. But we do need to support those outlets that exist that are trying to do something other than bring you, not just in the news reports, but also in the opinion columns, here's another government official telling you why you need to support what the U.S. government is doing. Here's another corporate poncho telling you why whatever corporate America is doing is in your best interest. We need folks who can be critical of power in a sustained way, in an ongoing way. That's the gaping hole in the U.S. news media system. Anna? Why do we take opinion columns seriously? If Thomas Friedman knows so much about Gaza, why isn't he covering it as a journalist yeah. with all of the checks and, and rigors that that requires? Why are we so accepting of opinion columns in newspapers as sources of information? That's an excellent question. And why these Sunday shows where folks sit around in a circle and stroke their chins and offer their opinions. Like, who are you? Are you a regional expert? Are you a historian? No, you're just a journalist who has some stray thoughts. And, and why should we take that seriously? I mean, that is part of what we and FAIR complain about, is the idea that news media don't seem to go to folks who have experience or history or knowledge or expertise. They have the same circle of folks that they talk to. And it doesn't matter if those folks get things wrong, catastrophically, historically, they're still in the conversation. And it doesn't matter if folks outside of that conversation get things right, they still don't get included in that conversation. It's basically a cocktail party, and you and I are not invited. And so why do we take it seriously? I think we do less and less. But I also think that there's a tendency to just pick up a paper or turn on a TV news show and just imagine that you're being told everything you need to know about what's going on and that the people that you're hearing from are the people best placed to tell it to you. That's a difficult thing to disabuse ourselves of, but it's happening. We've been talking with Janine Jackson, who is FAIR's program director and producer host of FAIR's syndicated weekly radio show, Counterspin, which I urge all of you to listen to. It's so tight and focused and sequential, very professionally produced, I must say, Janine. And thank we so thank much. you very much. Give our listeners once again how they can get extra and get more information. Well, it's been my sincere pleasure to be here. I will say again, I am a media critic because I see it as consumer advocacy, and my love for consumer advocacy has a whole lot to do with Ralph Nader. So I thank you again. Folks can go to fair.org and learn more about the work that we do. A lot of it's on the website, but it's also the way to get access to Extra, the newsletter, and Counterspin, the radio show. Thank you, Janine Jackson, for all your good work and those at FAIR. It's been my pleasure. Thank you, Ralph Nader. We've been speaking with Janine Jackson. We will link to FAIR at ralphnaderradiohour.com. Up next, we put a human face on the tragedy in Gaza. But first, let's check in with our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber. 
from the National Press Building in Washington, D.C. This is your Corporate Crime Reporter Morning Minute for Friday, February 9, 2024. I'm Russell Mokhyber. America has recently brought its age-old love of sports betting out of the shadows and onto our phones And this has created an all-time mismatch pitting man against machine. Gamblers overwhelmingly young men versus gambling companies armed with sophisticated AI, data, and engineering, enticing fans to make snap bets, not just on games, but on every play within games. The early results, billions for gambling companies, leagues, and state governments, and a growing population of sports bettors struggling to defend against the rush. That's according to a report from the CBS News program, 60 Minutes. For the Corporate Crime Reporter, I'm Russell Mokhyber. Thank you, Russell. Welcome back to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. I'm Steve Scrovan, along with David Feldman and Hannah and Ralph. Dr. Tarek Haddad was raised in Gaza, lives in America now, and has lost nearly 100 members of his family in the ongoing bombardment. David? Dr. Tarek Adad is a cardiologist and member of the Virginia Coalition for Human Rights, a broadly based growing coalition of 19 organizations with over 10,000 Virginians from diverse backgrounds who advocate for Palestinian human rights. Dr. Haddad grew up in Gaza. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Dr. Tarek Haddad. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Welcome indeed, but what you're going to relate is not going to be easy to take for our listeners, but bear with us, listeners. We have to face up to it because it's your tax dollars, it's your U.S. weapons, it's the backing of the United States with the Security Council veto of any resolution designed to protect the safety and human rights of Palestinian people, and of course, the full-throated support of the Netanyahu regime, regardless of what is stated about minimizing civilian casualties by Secretary of State Blinken or President Biden. It's the shipment of weapons and cover, diplomatic and political, that is what Netanyahu wants and gets. The rest is just deceptive rhetoric. You've lost almost 100 members of your family in Gaza since October 7th. That's correct. I'd like you to describe the whole scene as you know it so well. So I apologize. It's a little bit difficult to go through, but it's the last four months have been an absolute nightmare for our family. We have a large family. My mother's side of the family is from the town of Khan Yunus, which is in southern, the southern Gaza Strip, and my father's side of the family is in, from Gaza City. We have hundreds and hundreds of family members. And I grew up there basically over the past four months. My routine has been basically every morning finding out who's died, who's survived, who's suffering, who needs help. And it's been a constant daily thing starting from October. Just to recount a couple of stories. So um, on October 25th, we got word and from Khan Yunus, one of my cousins, Jamal Al-Farra, his son, Tawfiq Al-Farra, who's a physician, his wife, who was pregnant, Dana, two of their beautiful daughters, Zareem and Hada, Jamad's brother, Assam, and his wife, Samad, and their daughters, Rasul, Tukhan, Nadian, three generations of one family, multiple siblings, grandfather, grandkids, every one of them were all killed, 10 people. Tukha, one of the children who was in her early 20s, her wedding day was the day she was killed. They all came from very modest means. They grew up just a couple of houses down from where I was raised. And three of them actually had built their family homes with their own hands because they were of modest means. And the whole, every house got, the whole multi-level house got destroyed. This entire family got erased off the civil registry, essentially, three generations. Then just literally another couple days later, in late October, my cousins Hatim and Aziz al farra also from Khan Yunus, from my mom's al farras side of the family, they lived 20 yards from where I grew up, from my grandparents' home in Khan Yunus. And they were killed along with 14 members of their family, seven of their children. Aziz was a pharmacist. His brother Hatim, a community figure who literally would do anything to help anybody. And Khan Yunus, he was always around to help. He just, whoever needed help, he would help. The day before, Hatim had actually gone to my uncle, um, Mushiyad, and asked him if he could house five families who were made homeless by the Israeli missile strikes in my grandparents' home. And of course, my uncle and I said, of course, please put them in our home. And that was what he was doing. That was the day before he got killed. There was one child, one, from this whole 16 people this side of the family that survived, a little kid, Hamza. And this child survived with an amputation, woke up 
in the hospital to find out his father, his uncle, all of his siblings, his grandfather, everybody had died. And then he himself died a day later, just because the situation in the hospital was so terrible. They just couldn't, they didn't have the resources to keep him alive. Then a couple of days after that, my father's side of the family who was in Gaza City, you know, started to hit them too. And so November 2nd, my uh, first cousin, Hani, and my first cousin, Huda and Wafat, uh, all siblings, they all got killed along with my cousin Hani's Croatian wife, Vera, and my aunt, their mother, Huda and Wafat were teachers. Hani was an interior designer. The tragic part is not just the brutality of it. It was, it was a missile strike that uh, hit them when they were all in the hallway, basically together. And it was very clear they were targeted at a time when they were all together because the missile strike happened as soon as they all walked into a corridor together. My cousin Hanny initially survived with what I know as a physician as a quite a minor leg injury. And then the very next day, he bled to death because he had no access to any functional medical facilities. Every hospital near them in northern Gaza had been destroyed. Hanny's brother, Wet, and my other cousin survived initially. And then he had to deal with a nightmare of watching his mother, uh, seeing his mother buried from the neck up in the rubble, dead. And then he saw his, his sister, Wafa, who he described to me in gruesome detail. He had to see her shredded into multiple pieces from the Israeli bombing. My other cousin had to bury all these family members in a makeshift grave because they couldn't even reach a grave site. And so they had to, he had to bury them near his house wherever he could. And that, and since that time, my cousin, the one who survived, he's sending me messages telling me he goes, you know, 24 hours at a time with no food, no water. That's just routine for him. Even after that, a lot of my family at that point by November were having to flee because of lack of water, because of flyers that were being dropped on them by the Israeli military, saying that if they do not move, they will be considered terrorists and will be targeted as such. And they even sent me pictures of these kinds of flyers that they received. So they all moved and to supposed safe areas. And then that wasn't enough. Samar al-Farra, one of my cousins, then died in a refugee camp in, in a supposed safe area in Rafah, right on the same day that she had completed her doctorate for her PhD. We we're about to congratulate her. Many of them then started dying from poor medical care and inability to access medical care. My cousin Abdul Rahim al farah died because he could not reach a functional hospital after he was injured from the Israeli military strikes. Then four of my family members on my al side of the family, ironically, were killed while they were in their car, literally going to the Gaza European Hospital for shelter. And they, get, they were targeted and killed in their car as they were about to get head to the hospital for shelter. A few weeks ago, a cousin of mine, Sabi al was killed with seven of his sons. And then most recently, just in late January, another member of my family, a baby, 20 days old, Sabi al he died from hypothermia, from cold weather. He was 20 days old. And this is after nine of his siblings had been killed and his father had been killed in a military, Israeli military strike in late December. So he was the only one other than his mother who had survived, and then he died from hypothermia, the baby. There's many, many more stories like this. I mean, it's 100 family members. It's hard to describe them all, but these are just the ones that kind of give, you, give your listeners an idea. And we're not special. We're no different than any other family in Gaza. Every single family you talk about, every large family like ours has experienced what we have. Dr. Haddad, anybody who thinks that this all started October 7th doesn't know the history of the terror that has been inflicted on the Palestinian people. Give us a, an idea of what happened in 2014, 2009, and when you were living in Gaza, about what life was like, and also in the West Bank. Yeah, so my family and, and, and I, we've been experiencing violence for our whole lives. It's, it stretches even before I was born. My grandmother was the head of the United Nations schools in the Gaza Strip in the late 60s and early 70s after the occupation of the Gaza Strip began. And she was routinely, she would get beaten for telling her students, educating her students on where her parents were from. That was her crime, to educating her students who were asking, what's Haifa like? What's Yafa like? What are these towns that my parents keep telling us they were from? Because every, almost everybody in Gaza is a refugee from somewhere else in what's in Israel proper currently. I grew up there from the time I was two months old. The stories that would happen just that I could recount Violence was just a part of life. I had cologne. My grandmother had cologne in every single room in our house. And the reason we had cologne is because we would get tear gassed randomly at various times, and we couldn't predict it. My grandmother had to have cologne around so that she could douse our faces, the children's faces, with the cologne so that the tear gas wouldn't 
just absolutely torture us and sting us. My grandmother, I, I had days where I'd wake up and there were soldiers in our kitchen eating out of our kitchen because they would use our balcony. We were on the third floor and they would use our balcony for as a scouting area to snipe at children in the street. This was routine. We just had to accept it. This is part of occupation. You can't do anything about soldiers going into your home. We had a beautiful orchard between Khan Yunus and Gaza. I used to play there every summer and it got completely and utterly destroyed by Israeli tanks. Every tree was uprooted turned essentially into a desert. We had hundreds of olive trees and fruit trees, and it was all destroyed, again, for no good reason. There was, it was an orchard that we just, we survived with, we ate from, we played in. That's all it was. That's just life under occupation. I played chess in the street all the time with my cousins because we lived in a, in, a, in a packed neighborhood. When I was 13 years old, in uh, around 1987, I, soldiers came up to the beginning of the street and just saw a couple of kids playing chess, I guess, and they ran towards us. They grabbed my cousin and broke his arm. I had to run. They shot rubber bullets at me. I had to just hide in a chicken coop in my neighbor and uncle's yard to be able to, you know, escape being arrested for just playing chess. I would go through 18 hours of checkpoints just to go from Amman and Jordan to, uh, to Gaza. We wake up at three in the morning. We wouldn't get there till about 9 p.m. at night. And this was after being strip searched and humiliated. Our clothes would be packed into baskets with five other children's families and then dumped on a big table. And we'd have to sort through them among five other families to, to get our clothes. You know, this was just routine. This was just life under occupation. How about the seizure of land and water? Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, water was, was so, so incredibly rare resource that you know, we couldn't wash our dishes, do wash our clothes and take a, re a normal, what your readers would consider an American shower type shower. We couldn't do all three the same day. It was impossible because there wasn't enough water. And that was even before the 2000s. And then once the, once the blockade of Gaza began, it became even worse. My parents would have four hours of electricity a day maximum. And that was, that was they had to do everything they could in those four hours. The winters were terrible because it would get cold and you, you didn't have the ability any electricity. You know, so electricity was rare. Water was even rarer. Often people had to recycle water. 97% of the water supply in Gaza during those days was not fit for human consumption. I mean, that's based on studies that have been done by the United Nations. That was before October 7th. 2014, during one of the previous Israeli strikes on Gaza, you know, it was a dark time. My youngest son, Ramzi, was born, but we couldn't celebrate it because the day he was born, 67 people were killed in a neighborhood where so my family live in Gaza, the Shuja'iya neighborhood in Gaza. And then I had 10 members of my family killed during that time on August 1st, including multiple kids, a four-year-old, a 15-year-old, an 11-year-old who was top of his class in the school, two eight-year-olds. And uh, the last missile strike that hit the eight-year-olds was as they were running away from the home in plain sight of anybody who could see it from an airplane. They were targeted and killed, two eight-year-olds. This is back in August 1st, well before what, this October time. And what can you say about invitation by Secretary of State Blinken with Palestinian Americans very recently? Where was the invitation? Who attended? How long was Secretary Blinken going to be with you? Which led you to reject the invitation and issue a 12-page letter, which included many pictures of your dead relatives over in Gaza that we can talk about in a moment. What so, was the nature of this invitation and yeah, why so did you reject it? Yeah, so the invitation was titled as a roundtable on the situation in Gaza. I'm quoting the actual email invitation. And it came from the Secretary of State. It was supposed to, it was in the State Department. My understanding, I was not told who else was invited in the invitation, but it was sent to prominent members of the Palestinian American community, particularly those who have family in Gaza or who have a connection to Gaza. And that's that's what I'm aware of. In terms of it was meant to be a small round table with six to eight people. And I was one of the ones invited. I was told it would be around a half hour meeting and that, you know, doing the math, about eight people, that each of us would have three minutes to speak of what we wanted to say to Secretary of State Blinken. Three minutes. And you turned it down. Why? I turned it down because what I've witnessed over the past four months is, you know, I'm a physician and I, as a physician, I, every day I have to empathize with people and I do empathize with people. I always try to put myself in other people's shoes. And I believe actions speak louder than words. As a physician, I can't just tell my patients what they should do and not treat them. It has to be followed with action. And what I saw was four months of actions that were murdering my family. 
that were murdering the 15,000 children in Gaza who've been killed, that have been murdered the 30,000 civilians who've been killed. Specific actions, lack of refusal to call for a ceasefire, vetoes in the United Nations for other countries to try to call for a ceasefire, multiple, multiple actions of transferring military equipment from our strategic military reserve to be used for this genocide, for this killing of children of my family members. And then most recently, right before the invitation, literally within 48 hours of when I got this invitation, the withdrawal of humanitarian aid, the most cruel behavior of all, the withdrawal of humanitarian aid to 2 million people who are displaced, homeless, hungry, have no access to water, minimal access to food, going through a famine, withdrawing funding humanitarian assistance for these poor people who are going through this. And that's what I witnessed. And, you know, I was asked, I'm asked to meet with Secretary Blinken and in three minutes to tell him what those actions have done, what they've caused, the suffering they've caused my family, the messages I'm getting, hearing that they can't eat or drink for 24 hours, the messages I'm getting from my uncle saying that he's getting diarrhea over and over because they have to keep recycling water, and knowing that my Secretary of State was one of the people primarily responsible for their suffering and their death, and the death of this unnecessary death of civilians. And I could not bring myself knowing that this was political grandstanding, that this was, you know, in all likelihood, a photo op to basically, you know, say that, you know, the administration is listening to Palestinians when actions speak louder than words. And I know that they were not doing anything from an action standpoint to actually help my family survive and, and end the suffering. And I couldn't bring myself as a human being, forget as a physician, couldn't bring myself to meet with somebody for a photo op as a grandstanding opportunity, knowing full well what this administration has done to cause suffering and death in my family. I just couldn't bring myself to do it. And I just, especially given three minutes, how am I in three minutes going to describe everything that's happened to my family and all my fellow Palestinians in Gaza? And you explained this in a 12-page letter. Is the letter available for the public? And if so, how can they get it? It is. It is. It is available for the public. It has been posted. I was asked to be able to provide it publicly, and it is available on a website. And I can certainly get you guys, get everybody that address. It's on a website called Here for the Kids, and it's https colon uh, backslash backslash here h e r e the number four the kids t h e k i d s dot substack s is in Sam u b s t a c k dot com, and you can access it via that website. David, could you speak to the happy memories you have of living in Gaza? Gaza, I wish I could adequately and eloquently describe to you how wonderful and how kind and how incredibly giving the average person in Gaza is. It's incre- it's, to say it's a disservice is, is sort of you know minimizing it. I mean, these are people who have suffered probably almost more than any other people in the whole world. They have lived, lived. Their average life is four hours of electricity a day. Their average life is not having enough water for everybody in the family to drink and to do their, their wash every day. That's their average. You know, they live like that. And yet, okay, yet they are positive. You know, I grew up there. Like they are some of the most kind people. They will do anything to help a neighbor. They will do what they, you don't even have to ask. I mean, we were all one family in our neighborhood. Nobody, nobody differentiated between them. And so I think, you know, it's a beautiful area. It's, it's on, it's, you know, gorgeous coastline. I, I have memories going to the beach all the time, you know, and, and beautiful orchards and just the family atmosphere. And, and I think the thing that sticks out too is there's not a hateful bone in their body. People, it's so tragic to me how Gaza gets painted in terms of, you know, they are Hamas and they are this and they are hateful people. Like, which is so ironic because they have every right to feel bitter, and yet they aren't. It's, it's like they're the most patient people I've ever met in my life. Like, they'll live with four hours of electricity, and they'll talk about how happy they are that they have their family. Like, literally. I mean, that anybody else in the world would, would be feeling sorry for themselves, and they don't. They just, all they worry about, all they care about are the basics. You know, their family, you know, having their life, having their health, and having their family. It's just, it's incredibly inspiring as a physician, as a person, like it's just, they are the most inspiring people I've ever met in my work in my life. 
Well, we've been talking with Dr. Tarek Haddad, who is a cardiologist, member of the Virginia Coalition for Human Rights, who grew up in Gaza. He laid out his reasoning in a 12-page letter to Secretary of State Lincoln for not meeting with him recently. Thank you very much, Dr. Haddad. Is there any final thing you want to say that we haven't asked about you'd like to convey in a limited time? I think the last thing I just would like to ask your listeners is just treat everybody like human beings. I look at myself in the shoes of somebody, you know, who has a hostage, who's a family member hostage, and that's no different than I can care about that. And everybody else on a side that you don't, that you may not understand can also put yourself in the shoes of a Palestinian who's lived under blockade and occupation and now genocide. And you can put yourself in their shoes in, in the same way. And I just ask people to see each other as human beings and not as people of a certain religion or ethnicity. And that's, in my opinion, the way around this, I think it's just more empathy. Thank you very much, Dr. Haddad. I hope your voice of humanity will reach larger audiences in the coming weeks. Thank you for your courage, your compassion. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. And I appreciate all of your kindness and your kind thoughts as well. We've been speaking to Dr. Tarek Haddad. We will link to his letter to Anthony Blinken at ralphnaderradiohour.com. I want to thank our guests again, Janine Jackson and Dr. Tara Haddad. For those of you listening on the radio, that's our show. For you podcast listeners, stay tuned for some bonus material we call The Wrap-Up, featuring Francesco DeSantis with, in case you haven't heard, a transcript of this program will appear on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour Substack site soon after the episode is posted. The American Museum of Tort Law is an event coming up next Thursday, February 15th, about injuries to fans at baseball games. Go to tortmuseum.org for more details. Producers of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour are Jimmy Lee Wirt and Matthew Marin. Our executive producer is Alan Minsky. Our theme music, Stand Up, Rise Up, was written and performed by Kemp Harris. Our proofreader is Elizabeth Solomon. Our associate producer is Hannah Feldman. Our social media manager is Stephen Wendt. Join us next week on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour when our guest will be historian Rick Perlstein talking about the MAGA movement. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you, everybody. And in about a week, we'll have the new issue of Capitol Hill Citizen. You want to reserve your copy, print only, go to CapitolHillCitizen.com. Thank you. Don't let them fool you. You have the power in your hand. I'm only trying to school you. Listen to me, people. Do you understand we got?